Okay, hello everyone. We're back uh, with the rest of the constant dimensions of articulation. And I basically just want to pick up this lecture where we left off last time. Um, so uh, we had talked about, first of all, airstream mechanism, then second of all, phonation, and then thirdly, place of articulation for various consonants. And the next one uh, I'm going to talk about, as you saw on the slide there a second ago, is aperture is what I call it. Um, and this is, uh, again, a bit idiosyncratic for um, the dimensions as I'm going to present them to you. Other uh, phoneticians don't really talk about it in this way. Um, I will mention, however, that when I um, taught this class with Cody in it, Cody uh, suggested the alternative term degree of constriction. So if you want to think about it um, in those terms, that's fine as well. But basically, air comes up from your lungs. You either voice it or don't voice it at your larynx. At some point in your vocal tract, you might make a constriction uh, with your tongue or whatever active articulator you're going to use. Uh, and then there's a question of how much you're going to constrict that airflow as it goes through your vocal tract. So how wide or narrow is that constriction going to be? Um, and we're going to go, we're going to walk through these options from sort of the most narrow or the most completely closed to the most open. Um, so the first option is that you make a stop where you have complete closure of your articulators so that the airstream cannot escape through the mouth. And we've seen plenty of examples of this already. Um, for instance, uh, the bilabials that we talked about were all stops uh, of some sort. So they were um, like P, B, and M is at least a stop going through your vocal tract as well. So there's no way for the air to get through your vocal tract when you produce a stop. Uh, that's why it's called the stop, is you actually stop the flow of air, right? <clears throat> there is also an another term for these, which is that they are plosives. Uh, which kind of focuses more on the sound that actually gets made when you release these uh, stop closures. So if you have a puh uh, and you close your mouth and there's a little bit of air that builds up behind the bilabial closure, uh, when you release it, puh, there's a little tiny puff of air before the aspiration that comes out of your mouth or comes out between your lips. Um, so you can kind of think of that as like an explosion of the closure, I guess, as it were. So that's why it's, an, it's a plosive. Uh, but otherwise, you can think of it as a stop which is, again, kind of a funny sound because the sound of there not being a sound, you're stopping the flow of air altogether. Uh, but that's the most basic kind of degree of constriction or aperture for your closure that you can use. Um, so we'll just say stop is complete closure, or we can also call it a plosive. And then we'll move on to the next option, which is not completely closed, but is just a tiny bit open. Um, and that is called a fricative, so stop, little bit of space and we get a fricative. Uh, so you get two articulators that are really close together. Um, and that means that the flow of air through your mouth is not going to be smooth. It's going to be partially obstructed because it's going to create some turbulence it goes, as it goes through a narrow channel, even if it's open. Um, there's not enough space in there for it to move through smoothly. Um, so kind of the mnemonic that uh, you typically use for remembering what a fricative is, is that you can think of it as the airflow is um, causing friction or the close amount of space between the articulators is causing friction of the airflow as it tries to pass on through. Um, so that friction or that turbulence that gets produced when air flows through that narrow closure, um, we hear basically as noise when we produce one of these um, uh, segments or sequences. So um, a clear example of that we've already done, um, which is say like an S or a Z, you can hear that turbulence in an S nice and clearly. Um, there's other factors getting involved with that particular one, but it's basically, it sounds like turbulence or noise or just kind of randomness in the sound signal. Um, similarly with, f, with an F or a th or something like that, right? Um, so that's our second option, a little bit open, and it's a fricative. So that's a narrow closure that creates turbulence in the airflow. Um, then the complete closure stops the airflow, and that's why it's called a stop. Uh, and then I'll give you a few examples of both of these before we move on to more or wider constrictions in the vocal tract. So these are our stops in English. We have six of them. Three are voiceless and three are voiced. We have them at three different places of articulation, right? So pa and ba are the ones we get at the bilabial place of articulation, ta and da at that alveolar ridge, and then ka and ga a little bit further back um, at your soft palate. So going back to stops, um, they're funny sounds in a lot of different ways, uh, but because, you know, 
you make a complete closure. Uh, you are stopping the flow of air altogether, so they're the sounds that are no, not sounds. Uh, but they also kind of take a different form depending on their context. So, like if you create a stop that's after a vowel, like op or something like that, um, you the stop to make the stop, you have to close your um, vocal tract. So you have to bring two articulators together. But if you make a stop that precedes a vowel, like in pa, the opposite of that, then the stop gesture involves opening up your vocal tract. So it starts closed and then you open it up after that. Um, so it's kind of like two opposite things you're doing. You just got to make that target somewhere in the middle, um, basically to make a stop. With that in mind though, that if you have a stop that follows a vowel, <clears throat> like the T in chocolate, um, <clears throat> give me a second here. You can close or make that stop closure for that segment. And then you don't have to release it at any point. You don't actually have to get that plosive part of it where the <clears throat> articulators pop open and you get that little bit of a sound, that release burst as it's called. So when that happens, um, you just close the articulators, make the stop and just leave it there. Um, you can transcribe that with that unreleased stop symbol. So uh, we get an example of this in the one of the tokens we heard in the transcription exercise, chocolate pudding. And I'll play it for you again. You might recall this one. Chocolate pudding. How can you forget chocolate pudding, right? Um, so yeah, so the middle of this, there's a T here, at least underlyingly, uh, at the end of chocolate, and then the next word begins with a P, pudding. Pudding. Um, so if you think about it, um, you can make that stop closure for a T at your alveolar ridge, bring your the tip of your tongue up to your alveolar ridge, close the, off the flow of air, ta. Um, and then at, before you ever release that, you can make a P, just close your lips kind of in front of that so that it kind of swallows up that T sound from ever being heard. Um, and you don't hear that uh, release if there ever was one. Chocolate pudding. So that T... It's made, but it's not released in an audible way. Chocolate pudding. So it kind of gets swallowed up or hidden behind the P, and you can use that released diacritic to when you transcribe it. Yeah, uh, just one more time. Chocolate. Um, so you don't hear the T there. There's another option that you sometimes hear in the same context in modern spoken English, which is that sometimes speakers will simply glottalize the T there and just um, turn it into a glottal stop altogether so they don't actually make that closure uh, with the tip of their tongue at the uh, alveolar ridge. Um, I don't really speak this dialect of English so uh, it's hard for me to imitate it uh, but you know it'd be something like cat cat as opposed to cat something like that where you just make the closure down here cat um, and don't make a T uh, and it sounds very similar so you can see why people might do it or get away with it. Um, but it's not transcribed, it's not the same articulation, so you don't transcribe it the exact same way. Okay, uh, English fricatives, uh, we got a whole whack of them. So at the labial dental place of articulation, the voiceless one is F, the voiced one is V, and remember all these are gonna make some turbulent noise as you produce them. Um, we have the interdentals, theta and EV. We have the alveolars, S and Z, we've talked about those at great length. We also have the post alveolars, ESH and EJ, and then lastly, but not leastly, we have a glottal fricative as well, which is just the H. And I wanna pause here and kind of highlight this one a little bit because I did not talk about this place of articulation, my bad, when I was talking about place of articulation. But a glottal fricative, um, the idea is you're just making a relatively narrow channel with your vocal folds as you produce a and you get the turbulent noise there for the fricative. Uh, so that's considered a place of articulation of its own, the glottis, uh, and it's called the glottal fricative in this particular case. And it's voiceless. <sighs> okay, um, there are a couple more apertures or degrees of constriction. So we went from closed to barely open to slightly more open than that is approximate. And that's uh, where you get a gesture in which one articulator is close to another, but it's not so close that you get that turbulent airflow being produced. So they're pretty close. Uh, but air can flow through smoothly still uh, without creating any noise. And that is an approximate. I'll put that here. That does not create turbulence. So a little more wide open. <clears throat> and then lastly, and that's kind of the, the main 
aerodynamic effects you would get, I guess, with uh, uh, constant closures. Look, no airflow, turbulent airflow, smooth airflow. Um, and then you can combine the first two into what's called an affricate, which is a stop and a fricative. So you get complete closure of the airflow or complete cessation of the airflow. And then a narrow opening, which gives you turbulent airflow on top of that. Uh, and that gives you an affricate like cha or ja. So that one's cheating a little bit. Uh, it would be nice to just kind of like go on a continuum of opening and closing, but this one's a mixture of it. Uh, but we're still gonna consider it um, an element or an option in the aperture dimension of consonant articulations. Uh, there's nowhere else to put it, put it basically. <laughs> so anyways, uh, we do have a couple of approximants or actually more than two in English. Uh, and I'm gonna highlight the first one of these as well. So, uh, well, we know about yod, uh, which is a palatal approximant. Ya, you can kind of feel that y narrowing or closure of the vocal tract uh, in the high palatal region um, or the highest arch of your mouth there. Uh, if you say we're like yes and just kind of hold the ya part, you're raising your tongue up, right, to get close to the palate, but you're not making um, any noise. I mean, you could try it actually, make a ya, ya, and then push your tongue a little bit higher. Y y to the point where you can get some turbulent noise and then all of a sudden you got a palatal fricative rather than a palatal approximate. We don't get those in English. We just get the palatal approximate. We use this symbol for it. Uh, and then the other uh, approximate that I wanted to highlight here is the wa, uh, which is known as a labiovelar sound. So I forgot to mention this place of articulation when I went through the places of articulation as well. So my bad part two. Um, I guess I'll add these on here at the glottis between vocal folds. But when we make a labial velar sound, then we are producing a sound that's at both the lips and the velum or a soft palate. And wa is the only example of this we have in English really. Uh, so a wa, you can kind of see or feel that you're rounding your lips for it, wa you might have a hard time feeling that you're raising the back of your tongue as you produce it as well. Wa, wa, but you're doing that too. Um, it's kind of like a consonantal version of the vowel oo, um, which is, you know, both back and round. Um, so the back part is what you're doing with your tongue. You're pushing it back there towards your soft palate. And the round part is where um, you are rounding your lips. That's the labial part of this particular articulation. Wa, labial velar, labio velar. Um, and I'll mention here as well, because uh, this might apply to you, um, that there are some dialects or varieties of English which have a voiceless labial velar approximate. So um, there's two ways to transcribe that. One is with this symbol for the voiced labial velar approximate with just a voiceless circle diacritic underneath it. But there's also a special symbol in this uh, in the IPA for this particular voiceless one, which is an upside down W. Uh, and this would be appropriate <clears throat> if you are a speaker of English who distinguishes between these two terms, which is which <laughs> and which. So with the voiced version at the start, it just sounds like which. Um, and if you're like me, you'd say this word the exact same way. But if you're not, uh, then you might say which. These are only ever signaled in English um, by this WH combination in the spelling, which is kind of convenient. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I'll just kind of leave it at that. There's not that many speakers of English that I've encountered in Canada who make this distinction. Uh, apparently, it's primarily found in um, Southern American English, still in North American amongst the North American varieties of the language. Uh, I will mention a couple things, though. One is that this has historical origins, so. Um, like back in the, maybe I'll put this in the Microsoft Word document, but back in the old days of say um, Old English, uh, there was a, well, a voiceless velar fricative in this same environment, like the word for wheel in English, Old English used to be H-W-E-A-L, E-O-L, whale. <laughs> Sorry about that. Got caught up in the pronunciation before I finished the spelling. But that's why we still have a WH in wheel. wheel. Um, so you might say it that way. Uh, but this H here was basically a, a you know descendant of a voiceless velar fricative like ha. Huh. Um, if you've ever read um, 
uh, sorry, I can only think of the name, uh, Grendel, <laughs> the uh, original, um, the only text we still have from Old English or Anglo-Saxon. What is the name of that book? Okay, I'll have to put it in the comments because I can't think of it off the top of my head at the moment. Um, but it's from about a thousand years ago and it's kind of our primary document of that version of the language. Um, and the very first like word in that is uh, this, quat. <laughs> and uh, it kind of looks like it should be something that corresponds to the word what, um, but it's not. Apparently it's just some sort of interjection, quat. Uh, but it's nice because it gives us this kind of like voiceless wa, and it also gives us a nice version of ash back when, when we used to spell it like ash. Um, this demo or this example is not going to be that effective because I can't remember the stupid name of that book. Um, but my mind is going, blame it on the pandemic and we'll move on. Uh, Grendel is the monster though that they have to kill. Uh, that I remember. <laughs> Anyways, um, there are two affricates in English. There's the ja, which is voiced, and there's the voiceless version, cha. Uh, and both of these are post-alveolar. Uh, and I'm not going to say a whole lot more about them, except um, that these two stops in these affricates technically are generally produced with a post-alveolar place of articulation. Um, so I had a student ask me about this a long time ago, so I'm just going to mention it, that if you really wanted to do this kind of accurately in a very narrow fashion, this T in a CH is a little bit further back from the alveolar T, so you could transcribe it with this backed diacritic underneath it. Same for the D in J, uh, because it's a little bit further back, so that retracts it um, to that place of articulation. Yeah. Still thinking about that stupid book name. Anyways, uh, this is a question that I would normally ask in class, and I'd find out what you guys actually think about it. But there are these two words, tree, or T-R-E-E, -E and D-R-A-W. How do you say them? Um, and if, yeah, the question is basically, do these sounds get involved in your pronunciation of these um, words at all? And usually the answer is maybe, maybe not. And there's usually actually probably some students who will definitely produce these words with these affricates in them. Um, so T and D can become affricates when they precede R, um, even though they don't aren't underlyingly affricates in any obvious way. Uh, so a tree and draw, like a tree, this T here and tree would normally be aspirated. Um, and instead of having that aspiration, it just becomes Afri an affricate. So it's affrication, as it were. Uh, so it becomes more like tree, or this becomes like draw. And I've got some samples of this that I recorded a long time ago. I'm going to try to do this on the fly. Um, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So I'll try to pronounce these both with aspiration, well, with aspiration and then with affrication, like two separate things. Uh, I'll try it with tree and we'll see what happens. Tree, 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 tree. Yeah, so we've got tree, tree, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and the trick is like the post-alveolar place of articulation. So an er is post-alveolar. So if you put a T before it, that T is going to be a little bit further back anyways to kind of assimilate to the place of articulation of that er. Um, so it's going to be kind of post-alveolar. And if you pronounce it with aspiration, that aspiration is going to sound a little bit like affrication or like a sh. Um, tree, tree. So that's me trying to do that really carefully. Here's just the, the aspiration part. <laughs> Maybe it sounds a little bit like a ch. <laughs> Not quite though, right? Tree. Uh, we can go to the second one, which is supposed to be an affricate. Tree, tree. Right, so this is just. <laughs> and hopefully that sounds a little bit different. Oops, just focus in on these two. This is the affricate, <laughs> and this is the aspirated T. <laughs> yeah, so I think you can hear the difference there, but um, they do sound fairly similar, right? <laughs> Yeah, so you can see why, you know, you might get a change there in the way they're produced. Tree. Tree. Right. Uh, so some people produce it this way. Tree. And some people just with the aspiration. Tree. Um, yeah, so that might apply to you. One funny thing, um, which I'll mention as well uh, before we move on, that, um, you know, there are some 
little kids out there who are, you know, kind of prodigious or um, precocious, I guess I should say. Uh, they're prodigies who are precocious. Uh, and they learn how to read before anybody teaches them how to do so. Uh, somehow they just figure it out. Um, there are apparently even more precocious, uh, just a handful of more precocious kids out there who just teach themselves how to, or how to write or how to spell things out uh, without people teaching them. Uh, and so those kids will generally, if they encounter a form like draw or, um, yeah, draw or say dragon, will pronounce or spell that initial sound with like a J, so dragon, um, rather than dragon. Um, they kind of glom it onto that pro. Sorry, that. Oh, why did I go to Serbian? <laughs> Don't ask. Uh, <laughs> anyways, they will glom it onto that uh, particular phoneme. Everything's going wrong today, but we'll soldier through. Anyways, dragon. Um, you can try that one out at home too. Does dr dragon sound different from dragon? Yeah, maybe not. Um, anyways. Uh, that's cool. That's all I'm going to say about that particular um, dimension of articulation. Number five, I'm going to call retroflexion, which is related to the R's that we were just talking about. So a retroflex sound involves the curling back of the tip of the tongue. And usually the only place you can do this meaningfully is in the post-alveolar region, right? Uh, if you're going to curl back the tip of your tongue, it's got to go kind of back, further back than the alveolar um, place of articulation. I mean, uh, and sound sort of like er. Uh, so there's that's the only retroflex sound in English. I'm gonna um, space this out a bit and um, make it a little more obvious. But the um, textbook and a lot of other places in the phonetics world will transcribe this sound the er sound with this symbol, like an upside down R. And I used to do that for many years in this class just because it's kind of like um, the convention, I guess, as it were. Uh, and people will know what you're doing exactly when you do that. It's not, so we don't transcribe the er sound with the up, right side upper because that's a trill. That's a r sound, which is actually a lot more common in the world's languages. Um, this is supposed to be an alveolar, uh, though, and normally the way we produce this sound in uh, Canadian English or American English as well is the post alveolar, like er. Uh, and so that little curly Q dip on the right hand side of this symbol indicates that it's an er rather than something further forward like a er, er, which I can't really even produce that well. So I don't use this symbol anymore, um, but you may encounter it. Um, and if you do, it means that it's supposed to indicate basically that sound that we produce um, in a word like word. Uh, in other languages, stops and fricatives can be retroflexed too. We'll get to them um, soon enough. Uh, but those are kind of fun. And I'll, I guess I'll mention, uh, like in this case, the ch uh, would probably a, be a retroflex to a certain extent in tree or draw um, because this is a post-alveolar retroflex sound. And so you'd probably cur be curling your tongue tip back a little bit for these two affricates when you make these. So they're not phonemically retroflex, but phonetically they wind up that way on the surface uh, in a narrow transcription. All right just rattling on here so I don't want to lose track of the scoreboard. Um, basically this means curling your tongue tip back in the post alveolar region. And that's dimension number five. And yeah, I'm talking about these like dimensions, like, you know, you could think of, you know, two or three dimensions in like a mathematical diagram or something like that. It's not they're not all that completely independent of each other because retroflexion depends on you having like a post alveolar um, articulation to begin with. So there's limits to that, but this is one other option that you have when you're producing sounds, speech sounds. Um, okay, number six uh, is nasality. So in this particular um, option, you can either lower or raise the back of your soft palate. Um, and this may allow air to pass through the nose during speech. And it gives you a distinctive quality such that air is filling through your nose um, and it's called a nasal consonant and you can also get nasal vowels as well. So air will pass through your nose as you make a nasal consonant but it won't pass through your mouth when you make a nasal stop. Um, and I told you about one such option not too long ago when I talked about bilabials. Uh, so I said we have P, B, and then also M. Um, so in terms of 
their aperture or degree of constriction, a P, B, and M are all stops or plosives, I guess you could say as well. But they stop the flow of air through the mouth, but an M is different because it allows you to have air flowing through your nose at the same time. So P and B, you can't, you just have to produce them kind of instantaneously. You can't keep the P and B going forever, but an M, mm, you could say continuously for as long as you want because it's a bilabial stop, but it's also a nasal. Uh, so we also have two others, um, two other nasals in English, two other nasal stops. There's the alveolar N and there's the velar angma. Uh, and those, the only difference is you're pushing, you know, you're creating the stop closure in your mouth a little bit further back for the alveolar at the alveolar ridge. And then for the angma, it's at your velum um, at the soft palate. So I'll keep score with that as well. Nasality is dimension number six. Um, so our options here are either, we can call them nasal or oral. So nasal air flows through the nose and oral air does not flow through the nose. Um, I guess I'll mention there's not really a good term for the opposite of a retroflex sound, but retroflex means that the tongue is curled back and non-retroflex we'll call it means that your tongue is not curled back as you produce the sound. Okay, so I think we're keeping track of our options as well here. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you is Beowulf. Remember the name of the book. Beowulf is the name of the book. I'll put it down here, Hwat. Yes, starring Grendel. All right, it shall never be forgotten. Um, anyways, uh, that's the prominent, uh, I think the first and most prominent book ever written in Old English. Uh, okay, so <laughs> what are we looking at here? I want to look at the x-ray video again. Um, so this is cool because you can see what's going on with the velum as this guy goes through this weird stretch of speech. Yeah, so I'll stop it right here. So didn't want to do that. Yeah, so at the very beginning, he's just sitting there, hanging out, breathing naturally, and you can see that the velum right here is hanging very low, because uh, normally when you just sit by yourself and are breathing, you're going to breathe through your nose, right? Uh, so this kind of allows the maximum amount of air to go into and out of the nose and down into your lungs and so on and so forth. But when he starts to speak, he kind of has to raise that velum up and that gets him into what's called speech ready position. So uh, you kind of move your, where, where your articulators are when you're just sitting and breathing is not the same position as where they need to be when you want to start to speak. So the first thing you'll do when you start to speak is, okay, everybody get ready and then go. Uh, and what happens to the velum there is it goes up and closes off that passageway so that air can't flow through your nose uh, in between your lungs and your nose. So uh, I think the first thing he says here is, Hapet. Uh, and that's completely oral articulation. So close off that passageway and just have everything go out through your mouth now. All right, and I want to focus in on that one a little bit. Um, so it goes from hade to hane. And you can see when he goes to Hade, he's got to close off that passageway again with his velum. Uh, and when he goes to Hane, he kind of like lifts up that velum a little bit, but not all the way. So he can still get air flowing through the nose. Um, so it's more of a question of like, are you going to close it off completely or just a little bit? Uh, at least the way this particular English English speaker speaks. Ta, a ka, a de, a ne, yep. a se, and we'll just a roll through the rest. A sa, hep. Het, heck, hop, hot, hawk, a tea, a te, a ta, a tu, a tu, a tet, a tot, a tech, a pen, he de, he da, he gi, he ga, e ya. Why did Ken set the soggy net on top of his deck? I have put blood on her two clean yellow shoes. Stop. I really hope he did not actually put blood on anybody's shoes. 
that's just wrong. That's not what phonetics is about. Um, anyways, so yeah, watch it again. Like I said, you can watch that whole thing a million times and still see new things in it. I kind of saw something a little bit new in it just now, uh, which relates to this next point I want to make, um, which is that not only consonants um, can be nasals, but vowels can be nasalized as well. So uh, when that happens, there's a diacritic that you put on top of the vowel symbol. It's this little tilde. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. Like um, where this often happens in English is um, phonetically in kind of a uh, not distinctive way. You get it um, when vowels precede nasals, nasal stops primarily. Um, to a certain extent, it can happen after nasal stops, but just not as commonly. Um, if you get a vowel in between two nasal stops, it's almost definitely going to happen. But like in a word like can, uh, this a ah vowel in the middle is likely to be nasalized. And if you hear it as nasalized, or maybe just surmise that it is nasalized, you put this little tilde on top of it, as opposed to like the a ah and cat, um, which is just an ash by itself. And I've got some old examples of me trying to produce this um, sort of distinction in uh, the word or the name Ben versus bed. Uh, not entirely sure how well this works, but we'll give it a shot anyways. Ben. That's Ben. Bed. Uh, yeah. And if you listen to that E eh really closely. Ben. It should sound slightly different from this E. Eh. Bed. And I tried to just excise out that vowel part. Ben. Bed. And maybe you can hear it there. Ben. Bed. Eh. 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 Yeah, like if you have air flowing through your nose, it gives it that sort of uh, distinctly kind of like fuzzy quality to it. Um, I mean, if you've if you've studied French, you're kind of an advantage in hearing this because there are a lot of nasalized vowels in French. Um, so maybe if it sounds a little more French to you, you can hear it a little bit better. I don't know. Uh, I will actually mention that thing that I noticed here. Let's see. D, he, da. He, gi, he, ga, e, ya. Why did nope. Ken. A little bit further back. He, a tot, a tech, a pen. Yeah, so he says ha pen there at the very end. Try to get it right before he gets into it. A tet, a tot, a tech, a pen. So after a tech. A pen. Yeah, so this little bit here. Um, and you can watch his velum as he does this. He doesn't really raise it in the same way as he does for the previous segments or items. A tech. A pen. He yeah, so if that velum is still down as he's producing that vowel, eh, a pen, uh, then that eh is going to be a little bit nasalized. Um, yeah, another funny thing that can happen in casual speech is that... Um, you expect these vowels before a nasal stop to be nasalized. And then if there's another stop right after that nasal stop, sometimes that nasal can drop out completely, like in a word like can't. Uh, and you might get can't, can't, can't. Uh, it's hard for me to target that exactly. Can't, can't, uh, where you just have a nasalized vowel. And then you compare it to a word like cat. And the only thing that's differing between the two is the nasalization of the vowel or not. So over time, if enough words start to do this sort of thing, then you might wind up with just a nasalization contrast in between oral vowels and nasalized vowels like they have in French. And in fact, that's where that contrast came from historically in French as well. Uh, and in theory, something like that could happen in English as well um, if it reaches sort of a critical mass of contrasts. Uh, my name, Winters, uh, if I say it the way I normally say it, like Winters, uh, I often will kind of like get rid of this N here before the T. The T becomes a flap, and then the N just kind of leaves behind a nasalization um, on the vowel before it, uh, winners, uh, which is the pronunciation my wife hates because she thinks I'm just mumbling. Um, but I'm from the Midwest. What am I supposed to do? Uh, this also reminds me, uh, we often talk about this in class, uh, like there's this town up in the mountains, right, that is fun to travel to. I don't know why that happened. Uh, Yay. Uh, so Banff, Banff. Can you try to say Banff without the N there? Maybe Banff, Banff. Um, so if you do, you're probably getting something like, ooh, how do I do a nasalization? Yeah, you're probably getting something like that. Banff, Banff. Yeah, that's a nasalized vowel.
um, that might be from your experience in Calgary. Okay, last but not least uh, is laterality. So a lateral in English is only, we're only gonna get it as a lateral approximate. Uh, and when you make a lateral approximate, um, what you do is you make an obstruction of the airstream in the middle of your vocal tract, thinking from side to side here, you squeeze the appropriate articulator down the middle and you leave space on the outsides for air to still flow through. Uh, so it's called a lateral because lateral just refers to like the sides of your vocal tract. So you're still, get, you're still getting airflow on the sides, just not down the middle. And this only applies to one sound really in English, at least phonemically, uh, and that's the alveolar lateral L, um, la, like la, 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 la. So like I said, to keep score, we will add that to our dimensions list. And we have the option of lateral. Air flows down the sides of the vocal tracts. And then central, air flows through the middle of the vocal tract. So if you're not making a lateral sound, you're making a central sound. Um, so we get that a lateral is L. Um, there's also two variants of L. You might remember this from 201. So there is a clear L, like la 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 la. Uh, and then there's a dark L, like o, 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 uh, where you're making uh, a closure not only at your alveolar ridge, but also further back with the back of your tongue towards the velum. O, o. <clears throat> and I'm running out of breath here, but I'll try this again. <clears throat> like when I say all, as in all, I'll try this again or I'll, as in I'm try I'll try this again, but the way it works in my variety of English is all, all, all. That's a velarized L. Uh, and the way you transcribe that is with um, a little tilde right through the middle of the L symbol. That means it's dark. That means you're raising the back of your tongue up to the soft palate. Uh, and I've got another video for this. Um, to hopefully show you what this is supposed to look like if you do it yourself or if you ever hear it from somebody else. But <clears throat> here is the word oil. Oil. Yeah, so he's got an L there at the end. Oil. And we get into it. Moves the tip of his tongue up like here, but also pushes the back of his tongue back as he produces that. You can kind of actually even see the back of the tongue um, going into this pharyngeal region in this view too, because uh, he pushes it back so far. That's the old, old part of that. Yeah, so um, it's easy as an English speaker to just kind of assume that's what L does. Uh, if you are a not native speaker of uh, English and you had to learn English, I'm sure you've kind of become aware of this, that uh, the L just doesn't sound like L, uh, it sounds like ol. And by the way, um, this is l -l 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 -l. Try really hard not to push your tongue back as you produce this one to get l -l -l -l, as opposed to l -l -l -l. Um, Like I said, it's hard to hear because they're allophones in English. So you probably just process them as the same. Um, but not every variety of English kind of has the same rules with respect to the velarization of L. So, um, kind of classic pattern that English is supposed to exhibit is that you get the clear L clear L syllable initially, like in a leaf, uh, and then you get a dark L syllable finally, like in feel. Um, I'll do a demo for that in a second, uh, but I'll mention the other dialect types first. Uh, the other one is where you get a, like a clear L before just front vowels, like in leak, uh, and then you get a dark L everywhere else, like in lock, lock, lock. Uh, as opposed to lock, as opposed to lock, something like that. And then others, like the one I speak, have dark L pretty much everywhere. So I have it even leak, leak, or leaf, leaf, like that. Um, classically, uh, I don't know this particular variety that well, but the Liverpool variety of English, which like the Beatles spoke, have there, there's velarization of L pretty much everywhere there. Oh, beetle, 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 beetles. I'm not even gonna try. I'm gonna excise out that last two seconds. Um, but I will show you this little demo uh, of uh, clear versus dark L. So normally I have somebody in class come up and say these words, um, and then we listen to them to see what happened. Uh, but you can produce both feel and leaf, and I'm gonna have to do it myself. You can try this at home. Let me know how it goes. Feel, leaf, leaf, feel, leaf, 
feel. Okay, let's see if I succeeded in not velarizing the Ellen leaf. <clears throat> I think it's pretty good here. Leaf feel. Yeah. So leaf feel. This is the L in leaf. And this is the L in feel. I'll get rid of that part. Yeah, I'm getting into what's called creaky voice with my uh, vocal fold, so you can't hear it as well. Well, well. Uh, and we'll check out this one. Leaf feel. Actually, I think. Feel, feel. Yeah. Feel. No creaky voice here. Yeah. But the trick is you can flip these around and see if you wind up with the same word. Uh, or if you're able to just kind of successfully make the switch between words just by reversing the order of the phonemes. Leaf, feel, leaf, feel. So I'm going to flip this one. And I think we have done this for our reverse name exercise already. But in case we haven't, this is how you do it. You highlight the selection and then you go to edit, reverse it. Feel, feel. And that L should sound a little bit different. Feel, feel. Uh, than it does when you produce it naturally in that order. Feel, 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 uh, as opposed to feel, feel, feel. Um, another variety I talked about Liverpool English. Supposedly, most varieties of Irish English um, have clear L basically everywhere. So feel as opposed to feel, like that. Okay, I think I've talked enough about Ls, and I think I've talked enough about the consonant dimension. So I'm just going to give you a summary. Um, of all of them, walking you through uh, them in the same order as I presented them in the lecture and as, as I kept score on that scoreboard. Uh, but this is for T and Yod. Uh, and basically, you can take any segment in the IPA, like T or Yod, and just like walk through all of its features for these seven different dimensions, and you get a complete description of um, the segment and how it's produced, right? So T is a pulmonic aggressive voiceless alveolar stop, which, oh, by the way, is also non retroflex oral and central. Um, the tricky part of it is, though, um, that these four last dimensions usually get combined into what's called the manner of articulation of a sound. And so that's why aperture is kind of, a, or degree of constriction is um, sort of a not typical term, because people often think of that as like um, the manner of articulation by itself. But it's easier to understand if you split these four up in this fashion, because they're all relatively independent from each other. Um, they describe different parts of the articulation. So when you hear somebody talk about manner of articulation, it's all four of those together. So like for a T, um, it's a stop, which is also oral. And actually I'll add something else to this, which is that there has to be some specification of like the degree of constriction or the aperture of a segment in order for you to understand what its manner of articulation is. Um, but then there are kind of like assumptions about the defaults for the other three of those dimensions, um, which means that you don't always have to explicitly mention them uh, when you're trying to describe uh, these features of a sound. So we often talk about a T as if it's a stop um, which it is, uh, but we know now that we could talk about those other three dimensions that it has and say, well, it's a um, oral, central, non-retroflex stop, right? So most of the sounds we're going to encounter in the world are going to be oral, central, and non-retroflex. So often those just get those parts of the description just get left out, out, and you say stop. Um, just by itself. So an, an N is a nasal stop because um, it has these other options being the same, like nasal, central, and non-retroflex. Child is kicking up a fuss. She doesn't like N's apparently. Um, and uh, the one that switches from the default is the nasal. Uh, and so you can call it like a nasal stop for that reason. Uh, but like a, a V is an oral, central, non-retroflex fricative, so on and so forth. And I'm okay with it if you want to describe the manner of articulation of a sound using all four of these features. That's great. Especially, I want you to understand it uh, according to those principles. Um, but if you want to, you can kind of leave this stuff out because it's assumed to be the case for these sounds and just say that, well, V is a fricative. And you'll notice like these other options, like L is a lateral approximate or R is a retroflex approximate. I'm only mentioning these other features when they are different from these three. 
And I think I've said that as well in this slide that consonant sounds are assumed to be oral central. Yeah, non retroflex unless stated otherwise. Um, and pulmonic aggressive as well. In English, that's kind of across the board. We don't really get any not pulmonic aggressive sounds, but we'll see some other options in different languages, which are fun and exciting. Uh, so hope you're, hopefully you're looking forward to that. And I'll also make one last big picture point in this lecture, which is that through combinatorics, uh, language can make a very large number of distinctions out of a very small set of um, articulatory gestures. So we have uh, basically seven different options for what to do with our articulators when we produce a consonant, but we can get way more than seven consonants out of those combinations. Um, and in fact, when you look at, say, the IPA chart, this is the uh, sort of two-dimensional table that they have uh, for all the various consonants in the languages of the world. And I've only boiled it down to the ones we get in um, English. Uh, so this fills in a fair amount of the chart, but you'll notice that there are also quite a bit of blank spaces in here where we could get other um, useful or meaningful speech sounds, uh, but we just don't use those options in English. And there's also, by the way, a contrast between blanks, like say uh, the blank for a retroflex stop, which is called a plosive here. Um, which is kind of open because there are other languages which have those, those sounds. But then there are also kind of shaded in blanks like uh, velar trill um, or like a bilabial lateral, um, which the idea is you can't possibly produce those sounds under any circumstances. So um, like I said, the dimensions are not completely independent of each other. They can combine in a lot of different ways, but there's a few options where the, the two different dimension values can't always combine with each other in some meaningful fashion. So you can't really make a lateral or a lateral fricative with your two, two lips. There's no way to kind of squeeze them in the middle without uh, squeezing them on the sides as well. So keep that in mind. Not all things are possible in this uh, breakdown. We're dealing with phonetics. We're dealing with human physical reality. We're not dealing with abstract reality like in uh, phonology. So um, we kind of have to keep those limitations in mind as we try to understand how people actually produce consonants in the languages of the world. Uh, but that's all I'm going to tell you for now. Um, next time we'll talk about uh, a similar sort of system for the vowels. Um, and it's called the cardinal vowels. So we can look forward to that as well. And then eventually we're going to expand up our um, knowledge base to cover in all these sort of blank spaces in the map uh, and talk about the sounds of the languages of the, of the other world, which is the primary reason we're here. So uh, look forward to doing that with you in a lecture or two. Uh, and until then, see you later.